Peter's letter to the churches of Asia Minor was written during a time of hardship and suffering for the early Christians. It isn't clear if this was state-sponsored persecution, possibly under the Roman Emperor Domitian in the late first century, or merely harassment and dirty looks from their neighbors. Either way, Christians were not the most popular folks back then, for reasons that we'll explore a little bit later. It also isn't clear if Peter even wrote this letter. Most scholars believe that its style is representative of someone who was schooled in philosophy and rhetoric, as opposed to the colloquial musings of a rural fisherman with no formal education. Also, if this was written during the reign of Domitian, then Peter would have already been dead. Regardless, I'm just going to call the author Peter, for simplicity's sake, even though I don't think it really was Peter. And Peter has some thoughts about human suffering that I'm not sure I entirely agree with. He believes that there is nobility and virtue in it. And while it's true that how we endure our trials says a lot about our character, there is a difference between suffering from life's inevitable tragedies and languishing beneath the lash of an unjust authority. The former is inevitable. The latter ought to be challenged, if not by the suffering themselves, then by those of us who refuse to suffer an unjust world. For it is commendable if someone bears up under the pain of unjust suffering because they are conscious of God. But how is it to your credit if you receive a beating for doing wrong and endure it? But if you suffer for doing good and you endure it, this is commendable before God. To this you were called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were like sheep going astray. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. Please pray with me. Everlasting God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations upon all of our hearts serve to glorify you. And may they be in keeping with the teachings of our Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. I know that Protestants don't really revere the saints, but you've probably heard of Saint Anthony. He's the one your Catholic grandmother prays to when she loses her checkbook. He's the one you pray to when you lose anything, and he's supposed to help you find it. Anthony was Egyptian, born in the year 251, raised by wealthy Christian parents, and by all accounts, a perfect child. He seldom left the house, preferring to study and pray, and he always ate whatever was put in front of him. As he grew older and his parents died, he lived alone with his younger sister. And one day, after pondering the gospel, he decided to sell all of their land and property, saving only a little to care for her. And then, upon further reflection, he sold that too and left her in a nunnery so that he could go live by himself in the desert. I don't see how this is especially commendable, but the author of his biography, The Life of St. Anthony, seems to think so. I read The Life of St. Anthony back in seminary. We were studying the early monastic movement and the so-called Desert Fathers, men who lived in little huts in the wilderness all by themselves, spending their days in prayer and rolling around in thorny bushes every time they had, well, impure thoughts. They usually subsisted on a little bread and water, and they were known to scourge themselves with whips, suffering for Christ, just as he suffered for us. 
Their biographies are also filled with demonic encounters, tales about their desert hovels being besieged in the dead of night by armies of scorpions, wolves, and lions. But Anthony didn't wait for the devil to come to him. According to the life of St. Anthony, that ancient ascetic lived near a collection of haunted tombs in the desert where he decided to spend the night. His biography reads, Then he left for the tombs, which lay at some distance from the village. This was too much for the enemy to bear. Indeed, he feared that Anthony would fill the desert with his asceticism. So he came one night with a great number of demons and lashed him so unmercifully that he lay on the ground speechless from the pain. Anthony maintained that the pain was so severe that the blows could not have been inflicted by man and caused such agony. By God's providence, his acquaintance came the next day with bread for him. When he opened the door and saw him lying on the ground as if dead, he lifted him up and carried him to the village church. But around midnight, Anthony regained consciousness and beckoned his friend to his side and asked him to lift him up and carry him back to the tombs. Seems a shame, given his efforts, that bold St. Anthony has been reduced to spending eternity helping people find their car keys. <laughs> but then he always was a glutton for punishment. The more he suffered, Anthony reasoned, the more righteous he was. But where could he have gotten such an idea? Christian theology has always been confusing, and in my estimation, confused, when it comes to the matter of human suffering. On the one hand, we are supposed to ease the anguish of others. The Bible, both the Hebrew and Greek halves of it, the Old and New Testaments, are filled with exhortations to care for the sick, to tend to the widow and the orphan, to feed the hungry, and to fight for the oppressed, to reduce the amount of unnecessary suffering in the world. And yet, on the other hand, men like Peter and Paul tell us that our suffering is righteous, pleasing to God, and ultimately good for us. Jesus suffered, after all, and a lot of theologians have focused on this aspect of his experience with an almost morbid fascination. Yes, Jesus was tortured, and he didn't fight back. But he was actually modeling nonviolent resistance. And it's not something he sought out, like Anthony. His suffering wasn't a good thing in and of itself. But if Jesus suffered for us, they argue, then we should suffer for him. Because Christ also suffered for you, Peter says in our text this morning, leaving you an example so that you should follow in his steps. That's the case being made in this scripture, that suffering is virtuous and noble. This passage is an excerpt from what biblical scholars sometimes call the household code. These are New Testament writings, primarily attributed to Peter and Paul, that describe ideal relationships in both the family and in wider society. Now these conform, notably, to Roman norms and expectations. Children were subject to their parents, imagine that, but women were also subject to their husbands, and slaves were subject to their masters. For the husband is the head of the wife, mansplains Paul in his letter to the Ephesians, just as Christ is the head of the church. Now more contemporary translations try to soften this, simply encouraging wives to support their spouses, but that's not what Paul said. In the verse that immediately precedes our reading this morning, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 18, Peter says, Slaves, accept the authority of your masters with all deference, not only those who are kind and gentle, but also those who are harsh. Then he goes on to talk about getting literally beaten and why there's virtue to be found in it. St. Anthony, it seems, took that literally. But when it comes to slaves who are abused against their will, well, you begin to see what I mean when I say that this passage is morally troubling. 
Now, to be fair, the authors of these texts had their reasons for conforming to the Roman zeitgeist. Early Christianity was a distinctly unpopular religion. Anything monotheistic in those days was regarded as a weird cult. Some people thought that they were cannibals, literally consuming the flesh and blood of their master in the sacrament of Holy Communion, and their founder was executed for treason. They needed a good PR specialist, or at least a brilliant marketing campaign, or, you know, they, at the very least they had to avoid making things worse for themselves than they already were in the court of public opinion and in the eyes of the Roman authorities. But that doesn't make their take on misogyny and slavery any more palatable. Rather than condemn the abusive relationships that lay at the foundation of their society, Peter and Paul encouraged women and slaves and other marginalized people to accept their miserable lot. If you endure when you do right and suffer for it, Peter tells us, you have God's approval. But is that really what God wants for us? Is that really what God wants for anyone? Now, St. Anthony took his beatings lying down, but other desert fathers weren't so eager to let the devil have their way with them. Another account describes a monk named St. Macarius, who also spent the night in an Egyptian tomb in order to confront the evil spirits who lurked there. Macarius, and I quote, pulled a mummy from its niche to use as his pillow during the night. When the demon inevitably began to whisper to him threateningly in the darkness, he pummeled the mummy until he drove it out, thus plumping up his pillow in the process. Are we called to suffer passively, like Anthony, or to rail against evil influences, like Macarius? Shakespeare's Hamlet famously wondered aloud, Is it nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of troubles, and by opposing, end them. Now, in truth, a lot of us aren't suffering all that much in the midst of this pandemic. Yes, we've all had to make sacrifices. When a woman that my wife works with first heard about the stay-at-home order, the blood drained from her face, and her usually calm demeanor melted away as she cried out, panicked, but where am I going to get my hair done? <laughs> Sacrifices, yes. But for my part, I'm not really suffering. Not like the ones who've gotten sick, or lost their jobs, or their businesses, or their loved ones, or their lives. Those people, and maybe some of you, have lost things that even St. Anthony can't help them find. According to Buddhist philosophy, we suffer when reality doesn't conform to our expectations. The Buddhist word for suffering, dukkha, can be literally translated as axle hole. You see, the nomads who brought Sanskrit to ancient India rode on wagons. And if a wagon wheel wasn't properly aligned with the axle, then you'd be in for a bumpy ride. If your axle hole was out of joint, you'd be very unhappy. Suffering can be mitigated, therefore, by aligning the wheel with the axle. Or in other words, aligning our expectations with our reality. Now there's some wisdom in this. But when you apply it to Peter's encouragement for slaves to fall in line and obey their masters, it just feels wrong. Yes, our expectations can be changed, lowered if necessary. But if the axle is broken, do we really want to put our wheel on it? Friends, our society is broken. It's hard to pretend that it isn't these days. The suffering that we endure now, whether it's merely being stuck in the house, or losing your job, or dying for a lack of a ventilator, probably could have been mitigated with better preparation more accessible health care, stronger safety nets, and the things that make for a more equitable society. They can be mitigated now by staying away from each other, 
or it can be exacerbated by gathering in crowds to protest stay-at-home orders. We have some degree of agency in shaping our reality in the world that we live in. And when all this is over, we have a chance to hit the reset button, to build a more just and compassionate society, something closer to the kingdom of God. The Bible tells us specifically in the book of Exodus, thou shalt not suffer. Well, in the interest of full disclosure, it actually says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. That's yet another text that has been used to justify oppression in one form or another. But if some people can take the Bible out of context to oppress others, then I don't feel too badly about taking it out of context to discourage oppression. We can let the powers that be abuse people as the demons beat St. Anthony. We can lower our expectations, conform to the systems that we know, and fall in line, like Peter encourages us, encourages us to do. We could fit our wheel on the proverbial axle in the parlance of Buddhism. But if the axle is broken, I think I would rather fix it. Peter tells slaves to accept their lot, but Jesus taught us to change things. He was a carpenter, after all. And he wasn't afraid to build something new. Amen.